Good evening. Merry Christmas. You all just look so fancy. Don't let it fool you, though. We're fancy, but on the inside, we're a mess still. We were all yelling at each other on the way here, trying to find seats, trying to do whatever we can, missing turns. We're not here to just feel nice and nostalgic. A lot of times, that's what Christmas routines are. So it's, it's a way to feel nice and nostalgic. That's not why we're, we're here. Uh, we don't just engage this routine uh, or, or have a big performance plan so we can be the biggest attended church service on this side of the Mississippi. What we do is, uh, as a church, we get together and we come in an intentional way with intentional things for uh, about an hour to worship Jesus. He is our King and our Savior, and He's the, the real reason that this Christmas time exists. And so simply put, we're, we're here to celebrate Jesus He's our Lord and Savior, and we've set aside Christmas Eve not as a, as a break from the normal routines of Christmas, but actually as part of Christmas and as a way of kind of making sure we're remembering Jesus throughout these days. Our tendency, not just at Christmas time, our tendency as believers is to forget about Jesus, is to forget that he exists, forget that he loves us, and forget that he really is is watching out for us and wants to save us, not just from sin in a general way, but from sin in a specific way. And so we get together on Christmas Eve to intentionally remember his birth. And uh, we do this every Sunday, not just to remember his birth, but to remember his, his existence. That's why believers gather on Sundays. Uh, and so if this uh, is your first time and if this service impacts you or your time here, you just, man, there's something different about this group. Uh, it impacts you in a certain way. We'd love to just invite you to be a part of what, what God's doing among us. We're, we're uh, followers of Jesus, and he is doing things in our lives. And we would love for more and more people to join our group and experience the life that God has for him. Christmas, of course, is ultimately about Jesus come to earth as a human to save us from our sin. That's a big claim. Claims like that... Uh, uh, require a response from us humans. You can't be apathetic or agnostic about that claim when you're hit with the fact that Jesus came to save you from your sins. There's, there's all kinds of claims like that. We have to respond somehow. Like if I were to say, the Cardinals are going to win the Super Bowl. You see, everybody, all of you responded to that. All of you in your heart were like, football, ugh. Or like, you better believe they are. Or not with the Bidwells still involved. All of us have responses that have been Cardinals fan for a long time, short time, whatever it is. When you make a big claim like that, humans respond. It's that way with Jesus. And so in our manger scenes, in our nativity scenes, uh, Christians like to put the shepherds and the wise men in there to talk about this response. And again, like Jess said, this isn't necessarily what it looked like. In fact, uh, the wise men weren't even there uh, at the same time. Uh, but we, we put them in there to show that God doesn't just care about announcing and, and coming to earth. What he's interested in in the scriptures, as, as we read the stories, the scriptures guide us through the response of that. And so in, in the Bible, in the four gospels we have of Jesus' life, only eight verses talk about Jesus' actual birth in one of the gospels. The rest of them all have stories about the response of people to that birth. God is telling us something there. He cares about your response. And he's wanting to guide your response to Jesus, to guide you to the appropriate response, to show you what it looks like to truly receive Jesus. And the wise men and shepherd are specifically there in the birth stories to, to demonstrate the type of response that God is looking for and, and what, he's, what he's wanting to see happen in humanity. Ultimately, what we see in these groups is a certain heart. And so we want to make some observations about these groups, go through Luke 2 and Matthew 2, and uh, talk about our response to Jesus. These stories are written to create a response in you. And that response that you have shows where your heart is. And that's an important thing to think about as we move through the Christmas season. Where is my heart towards the Lord? 
And so we uh, are going to talk about the shepherds and the wise men, two groups. You know, poor Mary. Who wants two groups of strange men in the room hours after you give birth? I mean, I can think of nothing worse. But uh, the shepherds get this announcement from the angel. The angel says this, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news. A Savior is born. What makes the news about a Savior so good? Why is that called good news? In times of peril, and times of desperation, we need news. That's the situation of life. We don't need some nice philosophy in those moments, five easy steps for working your way through this time of peril. What we need in times of peril and desperation is news. And that's exactly where the shepherds are at. Shepherds are lowly, they're of low caste, they're poor, they're economically struggling, they've experienced probably some sort of oppression, there's all kinds of struggle that they've had, and in the midst of that, they're longing and desperate for some sort of savior. You know, if you go into a doctor's office or for a wellness check, that's not that big of a deal when the doctor gives you a clean bill of health, sweet, I already knew I was healthy, thanks for confirming that, I feel great, this is awesome. Not really in need of news there, but when you step into the office and it's that CAT scan, it's that, that blood test, it's those, that, that news that you're waiting for, you are eagerly anticipating what that news is going to be. And that's where the shepherds are. That's why the angels went to this specific group of shepherds. They're lowly and they're desperate for a savior. They're longing for a savior. And so when they go and see Jesus, what's their response? Verse 20 of chapter 2, they simply return glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Nothing about their circumstances changed. God still... Dude, that was awesome. For those of you who watched online, the rain just kicked into high gear. That was great. No, I can't even remember what I was going to say. Um, yeah, cool things. Here's the deal with the shepherds. You might not be an economic outcast. You might not be in the lower echelons of society. You might not be experiencing any sort of struggle or oppression or, or any sort of thing like that. But what God wants us to share in with the shepherds is the heart that they come with. Their experience of oppression and hardship did not lead them to bitterness. It led them to readiness. And that's what God is looking for in the hearts of people. The people who are ready rather than bitter are the ones that accept and receive Jesus and are ready to praise him. And so you have circumstances in your life. Absolutely, we all have hard things we're going through. And there's no minimizing of that in Christianity. In fact, we, we somewhat are, I think, one of the only places that truly talk about the difficult things we're facing and name the evil that we're facing. Jesus is here to save us from that. And so the shepherds received Jesus because their conditions led them not to bitterness, but to readiness. God is, God is demonstrating, therefore, we don't need to become shepherds. That's, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story, then, is that we share their heart to follow their example of recognizing and realizing our need for a Savior and to be ready when Jesus comes. He will show up in your life. Are you ready? Are you ready? The birth of Jesus is good news. The, one who, the ones who are sick and tired of sin and evil. It's good news for the ones who recognize evil in themselves, recognize and name the evil going on around them. We're desperate and in need of a Savior. And so when you, when you see the shepherds, think good news. Think of the hard times in your life. The, those, those difficult moments that, that are, are being used by God to draw you closer to Him, to point you to your need for the Savior, Jesus Christ, who's coming to rid the world of evil. He has not rid it in full, but it's started now. And that's the good news of his arrival. We have this other group called the wise men that we usually say, or literally magi. It's in Matthew 2. Uh, this, is a, this is an interesting uh, group here. We don't know how many there were. Uh, we don't know a ton about them, and it's tough to really describe who they are. The best I could probably parallel within our culture is they're like uh, a upper class uh, system of scientists. They are the wise men 
of the culture. And they existed not just in Babylon or just around Jerusalem. They existed in Persia and Egypt, all over the place. There was this class of people that studied and wrote and passed information along about stars, about herbs, about incantations, about all kinds of things. There was all kinds of schools studying various things about the natural creation order and the supernatural order. And they did this stuff and they tried to manipulate these things and figure these things out for the betterment of their clientele. And they figured this stuff out through experimentation, trial and error, and they wrote it down. And so there's this whole group that's called the Magi or wise men. It, they're, they're the precursor to scientists, really, they're trying to figure out how to manipulate and control certain things. That's not necessarily what scientists do now, but what they were doing is trying to manipulate and c- control things for the betterment of their clients, for people. And so this particular group is probably from Persia because that, that was where a lot of the, the stargazers were and the people who studied stars to see if they could tell the future. And if you wanted to know if something was going to happen in the future, you went to these people and they could potentially tell you by looking at the stars. And they'd figured some things out and they were able to be successful in some rate. That's why they exist. People trusted them. So what a weird group to show up, isn't it? I mean, that is exactly who you would think wouldn't be in a manger scene. That seems so far off from the kind of person God would reach and God would want to come. But here Matthew gives us this dramatic reversal that they show up in Jerusalem to the king of Israel, the one who is supposed to know and be ready for the Messiah and actually lead his people to accept Christ. They show up and they have to announce to that guy, hey, your Messiah has come. And how does that king respond? With rejection and with scheming and with self-preservation and pride. The very person that should be in the manger scene, Herod, king of Israel, is not there. Instead, we get these astrologers from Persia now there because they're ready to receive Jesus. So they find out where he's at. They've got to know. They find out he's in Bethlehem. And so they go to Bethlehem. And what do they do? Going into the house, they saw the child of Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. The same response as the shepherds. These guys are a little wealthier than the shepherds, so they also brought treasures, the text says. They offered him gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh gold um, gold is is typically used in this time period we think for gifts of royalty and so this is a way of them recognizing that who they are coming to visit is a king you give a king and part of paying your respect to him is is to give him gold frankincense this is uh, the precursor to frank's hot sauce it was Jesus loved chicken wings, and so they wanted to help him. Uh, it's, a, it's a particular uh, incense for, for more of worship of divinity. And so it's thought that this was meant to symbolize that they understood Jesus was divine. I don't know if they understood that or not, but Matthew is wanted to bring that out. And then myrrh is an interesting one. Myrrh is typically used for uh, anointing dead bodies. And whether or not they knew Jesus is ministry and what was going to happen to him, uh, or whether they knew that or not, Matthew's trying to start foreshadowing that reality of what's coming for Jesus and his death and burial and how that was part of him saving us from our sins. But the big point that Matthew is making is that their visit has been part of God's plan all along. He expected Herod's rejection. He knew he would send his Messiah to his own people and his people would reject him. And God had been promised that he would, he would bring nations to Jerusalem. And, and uh, there's many places we could go in the Old Testament. Let me just give you a little tour of Isaiah. You can just follow along on the screen. Isaiah 2, verse 2, is a book in the Old Testament. It says this, In the last days, the mountains of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And the passage goes on to talk about they're coming to receive instruction. But the bottom line is God is promising at some point that he will establish Jerusalem, not necessarily as the highest in altitude, but the most prominent city that people come to, not to just see nice 
touristy museums, but to actually receive instruction from the Lord. It will be a city where nations come to it. Isaiah 11 verse 10 says this, And that day the root of Jesse, which is a way of talking about the Messiah, this Messiah will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him. His resting place will be glorious. So this Messiah isn't just coming to Israel to save the Israelites, but he's actually a banner to who? All the nations. Isaiah 25 verse 6, On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. Isaiah 49, 22, this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I will beckon to the nations. I will lift up my banner to the peoples. The point that Isaiah is building in several other places in the Old Testament talk about how Jesus, when he shows up, when God does this new thing, it's not going to be just for Israel, but it will include ministry to all the nations. And it's and it's kind of culminates in Isaiah 60, this great passage about how kings are going to come to Israel. And in verse 6, it says, Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. What did the wise men do? They came bearing gifts of gold and Frank's hot sauce and myrrh. And they proclaimed the praise of the Lord. Of the Lord. This is Matthew's big point. This isn't just some random group that showed up, but actually this is part of God's plan. And this is the purpose of why Jesus came. He came to save all people. God is in pursuit of all people. And he's pursuing you and I. The shepherds got a, a vision of an angel. They had this great experience of an angel singing to them. The wise men got some sort of weird star. Different things meant to communicate the same thing and draw them to Jesus. God is pursuing you and me differently. He's doing things in your life, and he's doing certain things in my life, and sometimes I'm going to wish, man, I wish God would do that in my life, but he doesn't. Why? Because he's wanting to pursue me in a particular way to reveal something in particular about my heart. And he's doing that in your life as well. He's wanting to pursue you in a particular way to get at some particular thing in your heart that is actually opposed to him. He's wanting to engage you in that way to talk about what you don't really want to talk about. And so Matthew is making this fulfillment clear. He wants to make sure we understand that Jesus came as a savior for the whole world. God is not just interested in a little group of people. He's pursuing the whole world, even though it doesn't look like it. Even though that we, the, the very thing, this very story where he's announcing that, you get the king of Israel rejecting Jesus. How is Jesus the savior of the world if the king won't even accept him? Some kind of savior that is. But that's the point. That God is pursuing. He's wanting to save, but not all will respond and receive him. And that's why the wise men are in the nativity scene. That's why the shepherds are there, is they're meant to talk about the response to Jesus and to help us understand this big claim that Jesus is the Savior of the world. What's your response? And not only what is your response is God interested in, he's interested in the why you're responding that way. He wants to dig at the deep stuff in your soul and talk to you about what's going on in your heart, why you're responding to this news this way, and, and what's, what's going on. You don't want to find yourself in the same situation as Herod, where you're locked in self-preservation and pride and, and discontentment, or you're locked into bitterness because of the hard circumstances. You want to find yourself with readiness to worship and receive the Savior of the world. There's nothing like a relationship with Jesus. He's king over all. And so ultimately, Jesus' arrival is good news for all people, lowly and humble, rich and esteemed. God is looking for the right heart. So when Jesus shows up, what's your response to him? And why is that your response? Where's your heart at? Are you ready to worship him? Are you ready to come with your list of demands? Are you ready to praise him for who he is? Are you coming with your anger and and uh, bitterness. Either way, God wants to engage you. That's what's the amazing thing. God's ready to have those conversations. 2,000 years ago, 
Jesus the Savior was born as a human baby in Bethlehem. He grew up and he ministered God's kingdom to countless people over the course of his life. He then was arrested and put to death on a Roman cross under the charge of claiming to be God and king. But three days later, he resurrected. He rose from the dead. And he now reigns over all creation uh, at the Father's right hand, and he's going to return one day and rule on this earth. And as we think about this first advent, we're anticipating that second advent. And as we are confronted with the reality of this news, of who Jesus is, what's your response? The rest of our service is meant to be a response of praise and worship, but I'd invite you to join us in that. As we sing, as we give, as we have our candlelighting time, all of that is meant to uh, guide our response as believers through songs that believers have written over the course of the many years, decades, and millennia of following Jesus. We want to worship Jesus together as a family. I, uh, I have a nice family. I got a wife. I have some kids. And I could have spent the whole day with them. It would have been nice. But it would have been empty. It would have fallen short if we didn't come here and worship together. There's something about gathering together and responding in the way that we're going to respond to worship Jesus for who he is. Amen? Otherwise, it's empty. Otherwise, all this stuff, you're going to find some just, there's a, there's an emptiness and a vainness to it. But this really is, is what we're called and meant to do. And so uh, let's praise the Lord together as, as Jess and the team lead us.